So we've got some folks here with a glass half full. I'm glad to see that. And some folks with a glass half empty. That doesn't surprise me. And sometimes all our glasses feel a little bit low, don't they, to be honest? But we're talking about opposites this morning. Last week we talked, I asked you all for some definitions. I asked you to define love for me and to define joy and peace for me. Today I want to talk about what are the opposites of these things. Because sometimes it's easier to understand something by the opposite, isn't it? your glass is half full, if your glass is half empty, those are two opposites. Sometimes it's easier to understand kindness by the lack of kindness in our lives. So here's your, your English language and Bible test du jour, okay? What is an opposite, an antonym for the word kindness? Yell them out. Cruel. Cruel. Cruelty, okay. And meanness. Apathy. What was that? Apathy, very good, because it's hard to be kind if you don't care, isn't it? Not too bad. Let me share the list from thesaurus.com. Animosity, hatred, hostility, ill will, indecency, indifference, intolerance, meanness, mercilessness, selfishness, thoughtlessness, barbarousness, cruelty, and harshness. How about patience? That's a tough one to think the opposite of, right? Anybody have an idea of what the opposite of patience is? Impatience. That's what Jerry Beard said at the first service. But I'm bum. These are strange to me. Agitation, arousal, cowardice, idleness, indifference, indolence, laziness, lethargy, weakness, mild, wildness, fear, resistance, frustration, impatience, and intolerance. How many of you have ever prayed, God, I need patience. I need it right now. Then we have, this one's easy. What's the opposite of generosity? Stinginess. You all understand stinginess pretty well, right? Anything else? Lack of caring. Amen. Anything else you can think of? I think I get you to start thinking for these sermons of mine. Selfishness. Amen. Meanness, malevolence, unself, selfishness, unkindness. Greed and stinginess. You'll see that they're very connected, aren't they? Because it's hard to be patient. Amen. It is hard to be patient. And be kind. It's hard to be kind without being generous. It's hard to be generous without being patient and, patient and kind. Well, let's look at the scripture passages we read today. Again, not the lectionary. We've spent some time in the book of Galatians talking about Paul's letter to this church that has frustrated him because he spent time with them. He's gotten to know them and love them, and they trusted him. And he's bringing them to Jesus Christ without the benefit of circumcision. And then the Jewish Christians say, oh, no, 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 no. If you want to come to Jesus, you've got to come through the law. You have to submit to circumcision. And Paul said, if you're going to circumcise yourself, just forget it, castrate yourselves, because that's all the meaning it's going to have for you. Because if you submit yourself to the law, you've got to, got to live under every aspect of the law. And we talked about how Observance of the law does not get us to salvation, does it? Salvation comes through grace and Jesus Christ alone. So we looked at that, and we looked at the fruits of darkness, which were what? You remember those things that deny the spirit in our lives? Oh, I know it's been a whole two weeks, folks. Immorality, debauchery, factions, divisions, envy, all those things that deny the power of the spirit in our lives. But if we have the spirit, what are we going to have in our lives? We're going to have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, generosity, faithfulness, self-control. All these things are going to be part of our lives, and that's what we're going to show. But let's look now. Where will we get these passages this morning? Anybody familiar with the passage that we read from Isaiah? If you've heard it before, you probably hear it at funerals a lot. It comes from the 40th chapter of Isaiah, which begins with comfort. Comfort my people, says the Lord your God. Tell her that her time has come, and she's going to be forgiven. There are three parts of Isaiah, three probably different writers, which is not saying that it was not authorized by the original Isaiah, but people were given the ability to write under others' names in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament days. And Isaiah wrote in three sections, verses chapters 1 through 39, which says, people, 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 if you don't shape up, God's going to let you reap what you've sown. And they end up doing that with the exile. They're taken into exile. But as soon as they're into exile, a prophet's job is then to remind them of the promises of God. Comfort my people. Tell them that the time has passed and they're going to be brought back into the land. 
are going to be redeemed and restored through the power of God who loves them. And this is the end of that passage. Have you not heard? Have you not known? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And we get to that next section that begins around chapter 60 where they are back in the land and they immediately start acting up again. And Isaiah has to go back to a harder word against the people's actions to remind them who they are in light of God's love. Those that wait for the Lord. Anybody ever have trouble waiting here? Anybody impatient here? Raise your hand if you're impatient. Oh, we've got a lot of honest people in this congregation. I've got both hands, and if I could raise my feet, I would raise them as well. Patience is hard, isn't it? What do we have to be impatient about these days? I already said the COVID vaccine that doesn't seem to be working on this new strain. Too many people haven't gotten a vaccine. People are tired of masks. They're tired of being sick. They're tired of watching friends get sick. We're back to 400 Americans dying every day now from COVID. We're tired of it, aren't we? We want it to be over. We're tired of political unrest. We're tired of heat. We're tired of this. We're tired of that and the other, aren't we? But if you wait for God, you wait for God. And how many of the Psalms say, how long, O Lord? How long, how long, how long? We come from a good tradition of whiners, don't we? Through the Old and the New Testaments, the Hebrew Scriptures and the Christian Scriptures, there's a strain of whining among the people of God, especially the people of God in Jesus Christ. And if you look at the New Testament and the Galatian church especially, Paul really is fussing at them about their lack of faithfulness to what he has taught them. He teaches them, he goes away, and suddenly they forget everything they've learned. Not like us, right? We're always right there. But here we are again, needing to wait for God. The people of the New Testament, after the time of the crucifixion and the resurrection, believed Jesus was coming back any moment. And so they're admonished to wait. But now we're 2,000 years later, and some people say to me, I'm not a Christian because I can't wait that long. And someone sent me something a few years ago that was absolutely, absolutely true. I checked it out. There was a person offering money for a virgin because they claimed to have the actual cross that Jesus was crucified on with blood that it contained his DNA and said, we're tired of waiting. We want a virgin. We want to clone the Lord. I'm not making that up. But that's how desperate people get. And people have talked about going to the Holy Land where now on the Temple Mount is built a Muslim shrine of tearing that down so that we can have the day when Christ returns. We cannot rush that. We can't even know when that day is. Jesus said, only the Father in heaven knows that day. I do not know that day. So don't even think about that, but just be faithful. So here we are. We're as impatient as the people waiting for the exile to end. We're as, patient as, the people, as impatient as the people waiting for Christ to return. And still, we have this fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and generosity. Hard to be patient. Amen? This one's a tough one, folks. And then we have generosity. Not mentioned by name in Scripture other than in this passage, honestly. That's the only mention of the word generosity in the New Revised Standard Version anyway. But... The passage I picked to go with, it comes from Luke. Don't be afraid, little flock, because it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Talk about an act of self-giving love and generosity, giving us the kingdom of God for our faithfulness. And we're told to sell our possessions and give alms. What is almsgiving? Specific type of giving. It's not giving to the church. It's not giving to this or that or the other. It's giving specifically to the needs of the poor. We're called to give away everything we have and give our money to the poor because we're our treasure is, is where our heart is, and our heart is called to be with God. Interesting thing, this passage, isn't it? All these passages this morning. We talked last week about how they're both a gift and a choice, the gifts of the fruits of the Spirit. They're gifts and choice. You can choose to be joyful, or you can choose not to be joyful. You can choose to be loving. You can choose to be kind. But I think there's another dimension added here that comes to us this morning from Micah that we read at the call to worship. He has told you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Kindness, I believe, is the most underrated thing that there is and it's the thing the world needs so badly these days. Kindness. 
Well, if your glass is half empty, then you remember the cruel things that have happened to you very clearly, don't you? We all do, don't we? If I asked you to say the most cruel thing that ever happened in your life, you'd probably all raise your hand and know exactly what it is. But what about kindness? I'm going to ask you again for some stories, because Jesus told stories, and that's when people learned the best through his parables. Who has an example of someone who was very kind to you at some point in your life? Anybody here have an example of kindness? Teresa. You'll never forget it, will you? Kindness. Going out of your way for someone. Anybody else have a kind story to tell? Kaylee. That's great to have a friend that will listen to you when you feel really bad. It's good that you reached out to her, and it's really good that she answered you with kindness and compassion. Amen to that. Any other kindness stories we have this morning? I got some if you don't, but I want to hear yours. Larry and Madeline Ayers brought in tomatoes. They were great. <laughs> Fantastic, Kathy says. And that was very kind. They didn't have to do that. It's doing something you don't have to do, right? Not that we're required by the law of God to show kindness to one another. But kindness that overflows from the Spirit is a great thing, isn't it? Now, I've had some people do some very kind things to me. The most recent was in the grocery store the other day. A woman was behind me in line and was very frustrated because I'm very slow with my shoulder and my knee and my sacroiliac and my compressed disc right now. I moved very slowly getting my groceries out. She looked very, very frustrated with me until she saw how I moved. And then suddenly she said, may I help you with that? And came and unloaded my groceries out of my cart for me. And then put the bags in the cart and said, if you need help with the car, I'm happy to help you. I will never forget her kindness. The thrifty penny. There is a man who comes in to buy clothing. He bought clothing in all different sizes. And they wondered how he had such a big family with so many sizes of clothes. They asked him, do you have a big family with all these sizes of clothes? And what did he say? He said, no, I give these clothes to men who are homeless in Baltimore City. Now that was kind of him to do that, to come out here to buy clothing, buy them. And in response, the thrifty penny decided that from now on he doesn't get charged for the clothes he buys. Kindness begets kindness. Generosity. So related to kindness, isn't it? To be able to give from beyond yourselves. Some of the most generous people I've ever known have been people who have very little to share, but they will share what they have because they know that to rely on generosity is the way they have to live. I can't tell you the number of times when you go on a mission trip that a family who has very little will offer anything they have to you. They'll fix you a meal, even though they don't have enough food to share because that's who they are. I worked with a pastor named the Reverend Dr. Lewis Shockley when I was at First Church in Hyattsville. Lou was an African-American, he still is, he's retired now, <laughs> African-American male pastor with a white female associate pastor. He said the greatest gift we gave First Church in Hyattsville is that we loved each other, and we loved each other dearly. He was a big gun. He turned down the presidency of a major university while he was serving there because he felt it was necessary to stay at that church longer. And Lou was a loving, kind man who sat with people as they were dying ministered to them from the depths of the love he had for Jesus Christ in his heart. And people would die, and then they would have a note tacked to their last wishes, saying, I don't want that black man doing my funeral. He would go, and he would sit in the pew. I'd say, I don't know how you stand the racism here, Luke, because it makes me crazy. And he says, Terry, Terry, Terry. He was a little older than me. And uh, began so many phrases with Terry, Terry, Terry. He said, we're not called to change them. We're called to love them. And I said, well, I'd love to change them. No, 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 Terry, 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 Terry. We are called to love them. We are called to love them no matter what. 
but in the ultimate act of who Lou Shockley was, we liked to cook. We, we swapped recipes, we cooked together any chance we got. This was in suburban D.C. where nobody cooked. They had the worst potluck dinners. I lost weight at that church, I'll tell you that right now. But we were talking about Thanksgiving was coming up, and he was cooking for his family, I was cooking for mine and friends, and how many people are coming to Thanksgiving at your house? I said, probably 15 or 16, and he said, how many pies? I said, four, and he said, what kind? And I said, but before I tell you about my pies, look, I've got to confess to you, I'm not going to make my own pie crust. He went, oh! I said, I'm going to use store-bought pie crust. He said, you can't do that. They're horrible. I said, oh, Lou, I don't have time. The day before Thanksgiving, quarter till six in the morning, someone knocked on my door, and it was the Reverend Dr. Lewis Shockley with six hand-rolled pie crusts for me. That's generosity and kindness and love right there. Those are the moments we have to remember in our lives, the kindness that has been shown to us, the generosity that's been shown to us, because I was very generous as well as kind, the patience that people have shown to us, and then it will flow from us because we will realize that all those things come from God and the Holy Spirit. If we stay connected to the Holy Spirit in our lives, those things are going to flow through us. And we will find that our glass is not half empty or half full. It will be overflowing. There's an old poem that I looked up this morning. I've got to find it up here in all my papers. But some of you probably have heard it before, but I think it goes with what we're talking about this morning. It was written by a man named John Paul Moore. I've never made a fortune, and I'll never make one now, but it really doesn't matter because I'm happy anyhow. As I go along my journey, I'm reaping better than I sowed. I'm drinking from the saucer because my cup has overflowed. I don't have a lot of riches, and the going's sometimes tough. But with kin and friends to love me, I think I'm rich enough. I thank God for the blessing that his mercy has bestowed. I'm drinking from the saucer because my cup has overflowed. He gives me strength and courage when the way grows steep and rough. I'll not ask for other blessings before I'm already blessed enough. May we never be too busy to help bear another's load. And we'll all be drinking from the saucer when our cups have overflowed. We've got to connect to the Holy Spirit every day. Why I'm asking you to talk back in these sermons, and this is what they do at the other service. I get better at that too, the first service, people speaking back when I ask questions. They're not rhetorical. But I want you to wrestle with these things because if you don't, you're going to forget them. But I want you to go home and here's your homework for today talk about with your family and to talk about with your friends the ways that you have been blessed, the ways you've experienced generosity, the way you've experienced kindness, the way you've experienced patience. And confess to each other places where you have trouble with those things, and I tell you what, the Holy Spirit will be active in your life, and you will be drinking from the saucer because your cups will overflow. To the glory of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen.